Gyanwapi doesn't really need an introduction anymore, considering just how much the Kashi Vishwanath case has dominated headlines for the large part of the last couple of years. It's something that most people feel very sentimental about, if they know anything about it at all. But it hasn't only been in the headlines, because it is the subject of a case, a reclamation case that is being fought in the high courts, it's likely to go even higher, and it's also in the court of the people, of people's sentiment, because this is an emotive issue about a 16th century temple that was apparently demolished by Emperor Aurangzeb to build the mosque that stands there today. And a person who has decided to document everything that has happened because he believes it is important for people to know exactly how it all began and where it's headed is Vikram Sampath, the very well-known, best-selling historian and author who's come out with his latest book called Waiting for Shiva, Unearthing the Truth of Kashi's Gyanvapi. Everyone knows Vikram as the best-selling author of a series of book, books on Veer Savarkar, and this book on the Gyanvapi case is his latest. Vikram, welcome. Thank you for your time here in India today. I know you're very busy buzzing around the country. Uh, you know, because of uh, this uh, fabulous new book. So first of all, our deepest congratulations to you. My first question to you, Vikram, is, you know, some people know what's happening. They've been watching the news. They've been, you know, seeing the conversations on social media. But very few people know how it all actually started. Yes. And that's where your book comes in. So I'm going to start by asking you to give us the backstory of this temple that became a mosque. How did it all begin? Yeah. Thank you, Shiv. And it's such a coincidence that I'm talking about waiting for Shiva with Shiv a day before Mahashivratri. Yes. So, uh, so the book came serendipitously, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the prologue also, mm. that I was working on another one on Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan. And it was Vishnu Shankar Jain whom I met, the advocate who's uh, fighting the Leading case, the case there, yeah. uh, with his father, Hari Shankar Jainji, uh, who had this exact angst that you mentioned, that, you know, while Ayodhya was largely in the public uh, realm and consciousness because of the movement, while we see, uh, you know, case, uh, the uh, updates on the case in news channels like yours or in newspapers, I think the common people really don't know what is it we are fighting for mm. or what mm. is the history of this whole conflict. Is it something that's just started now or for thousands of years our, our ancestors have been trying to reclaim this space which they considered as sacred. Kashi was a place which was considered as the city where Bhagwan Shiv had himself guaranteed salvation to everyone, right. the Moksh Nagari. And so that's why for forever, you know, uh, the uh, Sanatanis always considered this place as something so sacrosanct and important. And so they never gave up on this spot. Mm. There were mm. multiple waves of iconoclasm. In 1194, you had Kutubuddin Aibak first demolishing all the temples, including the Vishwanath temple there. Then Razia Sultan got a mosque built there in 1236. Right. Uh, and then uh, the Khiljis, the Jaunpur Sharki Nawabs, and Sikandar Lodi, who had a uh, large-scale demolition of temples in Kashi, including the Vishwanath. Mandir. And of course, the final axe was by Aurangzeb in 1669. But despite this long, tumultuous history, shrines fell, shrines rose, but the Hindus of Kashi never gave up. Mm. So, and this is the interesting story, the, the, the history of this place, right. where it is a story of resilience in the face of all odds. And also a resilience that was not limited only to today's Uttar Pradesh or North India. The whole of India, there was this consciousness, and today it becomes more opportune to talk that when, you know, we are being divided as nor into North and South yeah. India, and that we are not even a nation. Indeed. Uh, every day, all kinds of loony statements like this come. Hmm. So, uh, 1194, Kutubuddin Aibak demolishes it. Within a few decades, in 1212, the first, uh, you know, pillar that is erected there in the heart of Kashi, hmm. which says this is the city of Vishweshwar, is by an Eastern Indian Bengal ruler, uh, Vishwarupa of the Sena dynasty. Right. Few decades later, you had a Gujarati businessman, Seth Vastupal, who gives one lakh rupees in those days to get the ma magnificent temple constructed mm. there uh, mm. after that. And a few decades later, from the place we come from, Karnataka, you had the Hoysala ruler, yes. Veera Narasimha, who donates an entire village called Hebale, so that all the proceeds of that could go to the pilgrims, so that they could pay the jizya tax mm. to the mm. Delhi Sultanate mm. uh, to go and visit Kashi. Right. And in his inscription, he says this uh, is given so that all of this is uh, my offering to the lotus feet of Vishweshwar. 
the Maharashtrian Brahmins, uh, you know, their families go and settle down there uh, and revive that spirit of scholarship which had started, you know, diminishing right. in Varanasi after the uh, iconoclastic waves. And somebody who came in that uh, lineage was uh, Narayan Bhatt, right. who was called Jagadguru those days. He wrote <coughs> several compositions, uh, books, including Tristhali Setu, mm. which uh, documented the importance of Kashi and its Mahatmyam. And he had a lot of influence, uh, or political influence too. And so he convinced Raja Todarmal. Mm. Uh, and this was the time of Akbar, Akbar who was slightly right. more tolerant than the other Mughal uh, rulers. And so this, uh, in 1580 or thereabouts, you had this big, massive uh, Ashtamandap uh, temple of Vishweshwar that mm. was constructed. So exactly where the Vazukhana now is, that's where the Garbhagraha of Vishweshwar was. And at the four corners, there were four mandaps right. of various deities. And this temple of 1580 was what was demolished in 1669 by Aurangzeb uh, by September 1669, as recorded in the Masri Alamgiri, mm. where uh, you know the the soldiers of Aurangzeb. Uh, right back to him saying as per your commandments we have demolished, demolished all the temples including the temple of Bishnath mm. and that is important to state because we just had a few weeks ago including Irfan Habib who went on to say mandir to tode gaye par wo uh, uh, Shivji ka mandir tha wo pata nahi hai mm. so mm. very clearly in Masir so this mentions Bishnath it is, it is me mentioned as Bishnath so there is no uh, you know two ways about right. it though subterfuge is done to you know open the window saying yeah. that this is not a Shiv, uh, Shiv temple it is some Buddhist structure mm -hmm. and all of that I'm going to I'm going to come to the Marxist historians and the <laughs> Nehruvian consensus which you write about in just a moment Vikram but you know you know the current case yeah uh, uh, you know like you've written extensively and I read a large part of the book uh, isn't the first time that you know like you just touched upon it it's not the first time that a reclamation yes. case has been made yeah for the Kashi Gyan Bapi. Yeah. Why has it been so difficult? Well, it... Uh, through is, the British Raj. Through the British Raj. So the colonial records are replete with so much of uh, material about this. So the bloody riots rock Varanasi in 1809, 1810, which mm. are called the Lat Bhairo riots uh, in colonial records, where the Rajputs and the Gosais uh, in Varanasi, they managed to actually uh, burn down the Gyan Bapi Masjid. Uh, and evacuate the Muslims completely. Mm. And some mm. of the uh, British records of that time, the collector uh, Watson, he uh, you know writes that this is a place which is very sacred for the Hindus. And the way the uh, you know Aurangzeb's commanders had left the place, they could have demolished the whole structure and built a magnificent mosque. Right. But they left the uh, Khandahar, the Western Wall ruins, which we see to this day, mm. so that it is a daily reminder to the Hindus as a symbol of humiliation and insult that your most sacred. Jyotirling uh, lies in ruins in this manner. Hmm. So the, the, the Hindus never gave up. There was always altercation. And so Watson says this yeah. is such a sacred space for the Hindus. So let's give it up to them and let's evacuate the Muslims completely uh, so that they can have their masjid at another place. It's a very routine thing to have a masjid right. transported right. even in Islamic countries to this day where to lay a railway line or to widen a road, uh, masjids get transported. But a temple has a different sanctity because yeah. there's a Pran Pratishthit Murti uh, which uh, sits there right. as per Hindu faith. So this contestation happened then and for small reasons, thing, people were going to court, uh, you know, which um, in the, the people tree belongs to us, the branches, uh, you know, leaves are falling into our side. So the place was never given up by the right. Hindus. Uh, so British court records, which I quote extensively in the yes. book, are replete with these contestations. In 1936, there was a non-representative suit mm. uh, where the Hindus were not made a party called the Deen Muhammad versus the state where five Muslim men actually take the British government to court mm. saying they are interfering with our fundamental right to worship. They wanted to worship outside the precincts of the masjid. The Alvida namaz that was happening in the last Juma yeah, of uh, yeah. Ramzan, they would want to go and even start worshipping in the compound, and that's that the um, you know the British government prevented them mm, from. Mm. So in that case, very importantly, the British government, 1936, I'm talking of, said this is not a waqf property. Mm. There are no records to show that uh, Aurangzeb or anyone yeah. donated mm. it to someone. And secondly, they, it also said, as per Islamic law, you cannot worship at a uh, place which is usurped from someone else or which you have not taken consent of the other person. There is no consent paper of the Hindu side here. Right. So it's a usurped encroach, illegal encroachment by Aurangzeb or his uh, commanders. So according to Islamic law, according to property documents, that was not a masjid as of 1936. So even when we say Places of Worship Act and religious character, right, right. in 1936 it was said that this is not a uh, you know waqf property. Mm. And that was upheld even in the Allahabad High Court where the Muslim 
Muslim side went for an appeal in 1942, uh, where they lost the case. Mm. Uh, but after independence, uh, there was a lull in this thing till 1991. Mm. And that was when a new uh, suit was filed on behalf of Adi Vishweshwar, uh, right. saying, you know, this I am the uh, you know owner of this <coughs> entire space mm. and I want it reclaimed. Yeah. And that case hung around for 22 years in the Indian courts. And only now, December 2023, the Allahabad High Court has fast-tracked it yeah. and said within six months that needs to be and I'll sorted And I'll out. come to the current case in also just a moment, but yeah. I just wanted to clear up some of these things so our viewers yeah. you know, understand fully why this is such a big deal and why you know, a book of this kind has been written by someone as luminous as, as Vikram Sampath. My, my third question to you, Vikram, is, you know, uh, and, and a reading of the book shows that you reserve some very special words and sentiments for what you call the mythical Nehruvian consensus and Marxist historians. Why do you think they're silent today? Thankfully, because I think they were exposed completely, Shiv, in the Ayodhya case. Hmm. Uh, I think uh, K.K. Mohammed has written in his book as well, Nyan or Bharatian, me an Indian in Malayalam, uh, where he very clearly states that the Muslim side was actually conciliatory, mm. even in Ayodhya, that we'll give it up. It's nothing so great to them. I mean, ba um, Babri Masjid, it was called Masjid Janam Sthan uh, and not Babri Masjid till almost, uh, you know, post independence. Mm. Mm. So they would want, they would be okay in the larger interest of social harmony to give it up. But it was these Marxist historians, very eminent ones, uh, quote unquote, yeah. who egged them on saying, no, 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 don't give it up. We'll create uh, evidence for you. And finally, Finally, when they went to court, uh, we see the subterfuge they did. Mm. I mean, someone like uh, Dr. Meenakshi Jain has documented it in her yeah, book, yeah. Battle for Rama, where every one of them lied in court, including Irfan Habib, who about the Vishnu Hari inscription that which fell from the structure on 6 December when it was demolished. It clearly said that this was a temple of uh, Ram, who uh, Dasharat Putra right. and Dashanan Mardan and all of that, which clearly st said what it is. But then this was lied that this was stolen from the Lucknow Museum. It was planted by somebody else. The testimonies of the leftist historians in court is a hilarious account. Mm. You uh, you either laugh or you get your blood boils when you mm. see that. That most of them say we are not even a historian. We don't even know Persian and Arabic. We got our information about this from newspapers, from Times of India reports, and not really from any uh, you know accounts, contemporary accounts, yeah, because yeah. we don't know how to read Persian. They've said this on oath, <laughs> lied in court on oath and none of them have paid a price yeah. they still continue to be celebrated mm. respected i want i wonder if they'll ever you know pay a price for that kind <laughs> of thing but you know th that that silence uh, vikram correct me if i'm wrong actually huh. became even more deafening around the survey results yes uh, you know at that time there was pin drop silence yeah. let's talk about those survey results for just a moment touch upon that case? yeah the, the, the current survey results yeah. that have just come out so, I mean, uh, in, Gyan, in Ayodhya was a different case where, yeah. you know, you, there was no temple, everything was in ruins, you had to find out from scratch. In, as they say in Hindi, Haat Kangan ko arsi kya, here hmm. you go, you see the western walls, you don't need an ASI survey to tell you that that's a temple uh, on which the three domes uh, rest. In the Tehkhana, the yeah. Vyasji Tehkhana, of which Puja was uh, right. stopped in 1993 by Mulayam Singh Yadav's government, without a government order, it was an arbitrary decision. Till then, regular Puja was going on in the cellar of a mosque. Hmm. Puja is going on on the walls of the mosque of Shringar Gauri. Uh, what sort of a mosque is that, uh, right? And so, uh, we didn't need a survey to tell us that this was basically a temple where continuous worship was going on hmm. since time immemorial. But the survey was, or was, survey was ordered, ordered by the court. Yeah. But the 800 pages that have come, I mean, it lays bare the entire truth. And this uses the latest technologies, ground penetrating radar systems, differential uh, you know, uh, positioning systems, uh, handheld X-ray spectrometer, and that also some politicians and others have said this is all Hindutva report. Mm. I mean, ground penetrating radar cannot be Hindutva. It right. is a scientific tool which is mm. religion agnostic. So at some point you have to agree the evidence. The, the report talks about the substructures beneath that uh, so-called, you know, moss structure that remains and the dating of all of that. Inscriptions right from the 12th to the 17th century, not only in Sanskrit and Devanagari, but in Tamil, Telugu, Kannada and South Indian languages, yes. showing again how important it was in the national pan-Bharatiya consciousness as well. Uh, Khandit Murtis, broken structure, uh, uh, idols of 
uh, Hanuman, Shivlingas, and uh, Vishnu, Surya, yeah. all these have been found. So it lays bare everything. And so after this too, I think at least now, some of the so-called you know, eminent historians of the leftist dispensation, I think they may, uh, thankfully, making a, keeping a studied silence. Yeah. Because after this, what else do you contest? Right. Only Aurangzeb has to come out of his tomb and say, <laughs> yes, I did demolish it. How, how does, uh, you know, this isn't the first big reclamation quest, yeah. uh, Vikram. Uh, we've seen the Ayodhya dispute that went on for so many years. Uh, the Pran Pratishtha took place in January this year. How would you compare this dispute with that one? This is a much more easier case. That was the more straightforward. More yes. straightforward. It's <clears throat> it's what meets the naked eye. As I said, you don't need all these surveys, but we've still been so patient. The Hindu side has gone through all the legal process, and mm. it's a continuous uh, story of victory for the temple side in the courts of India. Uh, including the 2021 case that was filed by Hari Shankar Jainji and Vishnu Shankar Jain. At every st step, you know, appeals were done. There were so many attempts made to derail the case. But despite that, it's a continuous story of, uh, you know, sh um, success uh, in this case. So I think this is a much more simpler case. It right. should be, and if sanity in better sense prevails uh, on all sides, I think it should just be voluntarily given up, saying, yeah. you know, this is mm. something so important. This is not something of that paramount importance to the Muslim side, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of sentiments are associated with uh, Hindus yeah. across uh, India and over centuries, not just now. Uh, but, and as I said, Hindus never gave up on this site, whether it was uh, north, south, east, west, the Marathas, the Rajputs, the Bengal mm. rulers, the mm. Gujarat businessmen, the South Indian kings, everybody uh, had this Kashi as a very important, the Vishweshwar yes. temple, the same spot, which is called the Gyan Vapi, the well of knowledge, mm. Vapi meaning well in Sanskrit, <clears throat> right. so the name itself, Gyan Vapi Mosque, is an oxymoron, what mm. is, uh, it's not a Persian name, so you have appropriated that also, uh, and all the uh, Puranas and the scriptures that I have quoted in the book, they say, to the south of Vishweshwar is where the Gyan Vapi mm. well exists, mm. and Today, the mosque is exactly to the north of that well. So very clearly, this was that sacred spot which our ancestors constantly fought for. Yeah. So compared to Ayodhya, which too was sacred, but there the evidence was scanty. And a lot of uh, excavations, digging up, everything right. had to be done to establish. Whereas here, and of mm. course, Mathura is another case, which is even more uh, you know, foolproof than this, okay. uh, no, but so which we will not talk about. You're, so yeah. you're basically saying that it's a, it's a, it's a far, far simpler... I would not uh, want to prejudice because it's sub judice and it's going through the court. Correct, so I'm correct. Sure we have, we have to respect the fact that there's a legal process taking yes. place. And okay. you, know, you write a great deal about that in this book as well. Uh, uh, you touched upon you know, better sense. You use that word. I want to you know, quote uh, you know, one line, paraphrase one line from your introduction, Vikram. You yeah. know, uh, at the end of your introduction to this book, you say... I hope better sense prevails, uh, where places of sacrosanct importance do not become playgrounds of social unrest and uh, political toxicity, and in a sense of generous give and take in the largest interests of national unity and harmony, these sites are reclaimed. Are you saying the Muslim side shouldn't fight any longer and make a gesture of this? Is that what you're saying? Now, especially, Shiv, uh, after we've gone through the entire process of the courts, uh, we've, and the Hindu side has won, as I said, at every stage. We've got the Advocate Commissioner Survey, which was done in 2022, uh, during the course of which, hmm. the, from the Wazoo Khana, you had the shivling coming out, which was again debunked and, you know, disparaged as a fountain. Yeah. Uh, then you had the ASI survey, which was a more detailed survey. The Advocate Commissioner survey was just a physical inspection. So when so much evidence, you know, uh, in, in Ayodhya, we were told, where is the evidence? Show us the evidence. Here we are giving you the evidence and we're doing it in a very legal, peaceful, uh, you know, proper way, uh, without any violence, without any uh, of all of that. So that should be, I think, respected somewhere. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, social harmony, national unity, the albatross of that cannot rest only on the shoulders of one community. Hmm. Uh, any Is there a sense that might happen, though? It might know, I know it's a hard-fought legal battle, true. Which is which is the Muslim side's right. Yes, and they have every right to you know, fight this case, which is what is happening. But is there a sense that it might be an out-of-court 
settlement or a gesture of the kind that you're prescribing? I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm prescribing it very well knowing that it might not happen because once egos and positions get hardened and already, you know, politicians are praying over it like vultures on all sides. Mm. Uh, everyone wants to yeah. cash in on it for their dividends and particularly as in the run-up of a very bitterly contested election yeah. season. So people are going to use this as a ploy to create fears among different communities and all of that is going to happen. But that's where I... Uh, appeal to the, uh, you know, the saner elements of uh, all communities, uh, especially the Muslim community, their religious leaders, if at all it is possible, that, uh, you know, let's, and the, the, the same appeal is also to the Hindu side. Yeah. That, you know. To both. Yeah. To both. Now, the Hindu side also, I mean, reclamation is a natural course of justice uh, to, to get uh, justice for your ancestors and what uh, they have been fighting for is something that is a very common, uh, you know, right. uh, you know, principles of justice. So I am not a votary of this other theory that just give us these three, we will give up on the rest. Mm. I mean, nobody, no political party or a uh, mm. you know, social organization right. has the right to take that position on behalf of all Hindus. Right. No right. one has given them yeah. that right. So let the Hindus also do the some background work. Uh, there are various numbers floating ship. I mean, some say Kot Sitaram Goelji and say mm. there are eight. 1,860 or so temples mm. over which documented From hundreds proof. to thousands we've heard the hundreds numbers. Yeah. And then there are 20,000, 40,000. So we want, the ideal situation is we want all the all the temples back, uh, which is not possible, to be honest. Uh, but in that, can we have a priority list, mm. which is most sacrosanct, in which there is a lot of historic evidence, there is literary evidence, there is archaeological proof, and more importantly, it's been a place of continuous worship, right. uh, which means that our ancestors did not give up on it. Mm. They fought for it, uh, despite all odds. So in those cases, in natural course of justice, it is only right that, you know, we give that justice, retributive justice in a retrospective way to the fight that our ancestors were putting. Right. You know, the, the political toxicity and the social unrest that you express your concern about, you know, that first bit, I think, is a ship that has already sailed, yeah. especially with an election coming up. Yeah. Social unrest is something that should concern us all. Yes. Uh, you know, so how do we move forward uh, as far as that is concerned? How do the, you know, the petitioners move forward as far as that is concerned without... Uh, you know, taking their eye off the possibility of social unrest. But uh, my last couple of questions to you, Vikram, is also on something you just mentioned, which are the numbers. Yeah. Uh, you know, those leading the reclamation, uh, you know, enterprise in court, Vishnu Shankar Jain and his father, uh, you know, often say that this is just the start. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they say that there'll be similarly mounting reclamation efforts uh, in the Taj Mahal, in the Qutub Minar, uh, you know, and hundreds perhaps of other sites. Uh, you know, uh, Vishnu Shankar Jain has been on India Today with me, uh, you know, actually saying that. How would you reply to those as someone who has documented the case uh, and, you know, and has this overview of what's happening? How would you reply to those who ask, where does it end? <laughs> so it will end till the time evidence can be brought, brought up. Uh, as I said, where there is overwhelming evidence uh, of you know, scriptural, literary, mm. historic accounts, epigraphic accounts, archaeological evidences. Why should it be? Uh, and who gives anyone the right? And very coincidentally, the, all the three temples are in Uttar Pradesh, mm. but somewhere in, say, Andhra or somewhere in uh, Assam, uh, which the, you know, the North India centric uh, media or the people <laughs> yeah. here don't really have yeah, their eye true. on. Yeah. But it is something very sacrosanct in Kerala. There is some temple which uh, you and I may not know hmm. sitting in Delhi. Uh, so, so why should we deny anybody that right? If the uh, people here are having the right to reclaim hmm. Kashi, Mathura, Ayodhya, someone there wants to reclaim that. If there is evidence, yeah. if there is, uh, you know, overwhelming, uh, you know, support for that among the local popul populace and the consciousness, then it should be open game for anyone and that's why I think as much as possible if a, first of all the Hindu side my prescription to resolve this is first the Hindu side needs to do its homework get the list uh, very uh, you know foolproof list uh, get the numbers right. how many do you want even if you want to negotiate or put cases how many do you want 40,000 do you know the location of each of the 40,000 hmm. may, maybe hmm. not at all you may know some vague numbers uh, which are hmm. there so and then prioritize that and say then approach the other side and that negotiation is the next step where you know you go either out of court yeah. or through legal contestation if out of court doesn't work right. I mean even in uh, 
divorce cases, the judges say, you know, do an hmm. out-of-court settlement because a lot of muck comes out in court uh, yeah. disputes. So this case also has seen so much of bad blood between uh, the two communities. Indeed, indeed. We've had everything, including the Nupur Sharma case, which yeah. came as an offshoot of exactly of these discussions that happened Correct. after the shivling came out and the other side kept disparaging it as the fountain. And you saw all the unrest that happened, yeah. Kanhayalal's murder and everything that uh, unfortunate. We wouldn't want that to happen, but yeah. if that is the only uh, scenario available that through legal contestations we need to go there, yeah. then so be it. But uh, I feel this a time has come where a kind of a truth and re uh, reconciliation you know, commission, which is what we need to have in India to make complete peace with our past. Right. Uh, while India is poised for such greatness and while we're having all this uh, you know, objective of a new India, five trillion dollar economy, hmm. military might, uh, all of that, which is, which is catapulting us, we are on the threshold of greatness. We shouldn't be stuck in the past, and I'm saying that as a historian, right. that don't be stuck in battles of the past. Let's uh, resolve this so that I wouldn't want a scenario where our great, great grandchildren too are, ha you know, seeing in the news every day that an ASI survey is being ordered right. in some yeah. other temple yeah. in yeah. Meghalaya, some, you know, Karnataka, yeah. somewhere else. Correct. So which, which, actually, all, let's resolve. which actually brings me to my final question, Vikram, because, uh, you know, when you write a book of this kind, you're basically telling your uh, readers, thousands of them, that this is a topic that's worth caring about yes. and something worth knowing about. Uh, and I'm sure you're stopped everywhere you go and asked questions. So I'll ask you a question. If you were stopped somewhere and asked a question like, why should I care about what happens with the Gyanbapi case? How would you answer that? Final question. Yeah, <laughs> that's the googly. <laughs> no, I think you should care about it because your ancestors cared for it. Uh, and it was a pan-Indian, pan, uh, you know, uh, different geographies, different time periods. If even not only the Hindu faith, you had the Sikh Maharaja, Ranjit Singh, going and gold-plating the temple that was reconstructed by Devi Ahilya by Holkar. Hmm. And today people are creating schisms between the Hindus and Sikhs, saying these are different, uh, you know, sects and so on. So it was not just one group or one community or one, uh, you know, linguistic group which had this as sacrosanct and sacred. So everybody had this as a national consciousness. Right. and. An, importance of that was, uh, you know, underscored that way. So obviously as a civilizational uh, marker, it should be important to every Indian, including the Indian Muslims. Right. Uh, you know, these are spots which are of national importance to everyone. And I think this debate also brings to fore Shiv the usual, you know, schism between the constitutional patriots and the civilizational, uh, you know, patriots who say our civilization far predated mm. the constitution and you know the constitution we can say draws from this civilization right. which is why we have the Ram, Sita, Lakshmanji's uh, pictures in the fundamental uh, duties, uh, the part three of the constitution. Today, if that was done, it would be called a Sanghi propaganda and right. a right-wing politics and all of that. But our founding fathers yeah. and mothers, they did not think so. They thought these, this is part of our civilization. Right. Some things are non-negotiable. It's very much a definition, a quintessence of what is Indian, yeah. what is Bharatiya. And so it is everyone's business to fight for it. So, the so story I would give this very long yeah. answer to someone who's stops me and ask that short question. <laughs> no, I'm sure, they, I'm sure they will always listen to every word that you say because, uh, you know, your word holds value. You've written an entire book on an issue that most people will probably go through life knowing absolutely nothing about. I can tell you that we'll be tracking the case and how it unfolds very, very closely. Uh, you know, all of us wish that uh, absolutely no unrest results yeah. from, uh, you know, anything going forward. We're all Indians and we must wish for total harmony and peace, uh, you know, even in these sensitive and emotive issues. And we will continue to strive for that and track that. Congratulations once again on your book, Vikram. Uh, you. Thousands of people are already, uh, you know, reading it. Uh, and I'm sure at some point you'll have to probably write a part two as well. So thank you, Vikram. Thank you, Vikram. For thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you so much.